welcome. Um, okay, got it. Um, welcome to today's session. Um, just a few rules of engagement. As we all know, if you would not like to be shown, um, because this is a recorded session, if you would not like to be on the recording, please just put off your camera. Um, and please put your, your mic on mute if you are not speaking, so do not to interrupt um, the speaker. Um, as usual, we will have the speakers speak for about 40 minutes or so. Thereafter, Prof. Marconi will engage um, with the speaker in conversation, and thereafter, we will have a Q&A. Um, we, our session is 90 minutes. Thereafter, we will have our after party session, um, which is half an hour long. Um, that will be an, a non-moderated session, so very informal. People can just talk, um, but that will still be recorded. Um, so yeah, I think that is all. Um, today we have um, Jason on the recording. We have Prof. Antia on the moderation, and I will just um, introduce um, um, the lovely prof professor, Professor Patricia McFadden to our forum, and we are so, so blessed to have her today. Um, Patricia McFadden is a radical African eco-feminist who aspires to a life of freedom and joy. She's vegan and produces most of her own organic food on a mountain in Eastern Swaziland. She strives towards a balanced, respectful relationship with nature as it encompasses all sentient beings. Her most recent publications are Women's Freedoms are the Heartbeat of Africa's Future, a Sankarian Imperative, In a Certain Amount of Madness, the Life, Politics and Legacies of Thomas Sankara, 2018, a feminist conversation situating our radical ideas and energies in the contemporary African context with Patricia Twasima, 2018, critiquing conventional discourses on girls and gendered female identities in Africa, also 2018, Contemporarity, Sufficiency in a Radical African Feminist Life in the journal Meridians, Feminism, Race, Transnationalism, 2018, and forthcoming Women in African Socialist Projects, 2019. Um, prof professor, that has literally been the loveliest bio that I've ever read. Um, so thank you for being here with us. We look forward to your talk and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Chanel. That is so... Uh, generous, thank you. <laughs> and I wish I, you could see me. I, I'm sure my skin is on fire with joy. <laughs> I'm just so happy to be part of this beautiful project. This is uh, congratulations to everyone who imagined it and who has been making it happen. And I'm so, so delighted to join the ranks of those of us who love freedom and who speak, who say it out loud. So today, what I'm going to speak about is contemporarity. Um, and I, I, I really am speaking about the necessity of crafting new feminist discourses on our continent. Of course, our continent is part of the planet, of the world, of the universe, of human being. Um, and um, uh, in many ways, we, ca we cannot disengage from the larger meanings um, of our intellectual um, engagements, our the gifts, the intellectual gifts that we bring to the universe of humankind. But I want to focus specifically on uh, living on the continent, striving for freedom, um, arriving at the moment of almost 70 years, uh, seven decades. I am so proud of myself. I mean, I just love Patricia. She is... <laughs> She is something else, as we say in this region. And so I want to speak more closely to Southern Africa, because that is where the idea of contemporarity is embedded. So I'm going to time myself, or please just indicate to me, Chanel, uh, once I'm like three minutes or whatever. Uh, Let's take your time, bro. <laughs> Yeah, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So, so the basic question for me that I that I my stepping stone in the con, into the conversation today is what is feminist contemporarity and what gives rise to it? And uh, I, I I was thinking about this. I was looking for an entry point into this multitude of ideas that just, you know, rush through my mind uh, when I'm in the field with the birds, you know, they, they even now, they don't even appear afraid of me. They kind of, you know, uh, pass by me like we're just all, um, you know, uh, living in the same space which we are. And I really feel so honored by that uh, because humans have created this massive gap 
of distance between ourselves and other living beings. And a large part of our problems reside in that, that alienation, that sense of being far away from um, the sources of our political, ideology, ideological, emotional, and spiritual uh, uh, you know, uh, sensibilities. And, uh, and so there, I have many, many ideas that are sort of converging around the notion of contemporarity. So I focused down to two layers of why it is that this notion just sort of evolved in my mind and in my life and, and why, I, um, I, why I'm sharing it. Uh, I'm uh, presenting it as an open space, a wide open discursive space where those of us who love freedom uh, can uh, search in it. And if we find something that is useful, that expands our, our journey to be dignified human beings, that, um, that this is, uh, this is why, why the notion has arrived at this time in my life in particular. So I think it is a, an outcome from, I mean, just really at the, at the core, it's an outcome of women's and working people's struggles for freedom and dignity. And this uh, notion, this idea, this thinking place, the site of possibility and interesting intellectual adventure um, is juxtaposed in my thinking uh, uh, with the persistence of entrenched feudal and settler colonial, neocolonial patriarchies and the systems that sustain these hegemonic uh, repressive uh, uh, infrastructures of power. And all around us, we can see, uh, we know this reality, we know the status quo. And one of the things that has happened with COVID is that we are wailing even more loudly about this thing that we know for so long. Um, and this knowing is embedded in, in our psyches in ways that I have always felt uh, have us running in a circle. We're like stuck in the same place. We, um, even when we attempt to interrogate it, we repeat ourselves endlessly. And that's one of the critiques I'm going to make later on in the presentation in terms of the decoloniality uh, discourses that have emerged. So I'm just opposing it because it's a useful heuristic strategy for me. But I'm going to focus on what this new energy actually feels like and implies for me and its possibilities. So I'm locating it within the large struggles of women and of working people. And I also understand it to be an expression of a radical consciousness, which draws from centuries of resistance, specifically by women, and which is culminating in a shift, an epistemological shift, but also a, a, a shift that is felt even in our personal lives, in our corporeal existences. And for me, it has been uh, a manifest in becoming vegan and in becoming a small organic farmer who grows food for her table. And the shift has been, is an outcome that we need to explore and to excavate. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna use a term that is really problematical, but is very useful. We need to mine it. Of course, we know what mining means for us in Southern Africa. You know, it's one of the most vicious attacks on us and the land on which we have evolved. And it is ongoing and masked uh, by so many uh, fraudulent discourses and claims that are directly linked with the so-called success of uh, settler colonialism. Um, but um, it, it, let me say that the shift that occurs after centuries of struggle um, occurs at the social and political levels through organized liberation movements and through women's organizations and what are called civ civic organizations. But this shift also happens in the consciousness of individuals who nurture and define radical thinking and ideas 
And you can see the difference between those of us who insist on being radical, who are living our radical lives, either as eco, eco feminists, for example, in my case, or as um, uh, radicals who engage with the state in the legal uh, jurisprudence uh, spaces, or those of us who are recalibrating the possibilities of having uh, developing economic systems that are inclusive, that respond to the dire, dire challenges that face us as we are self-destructing. And it's right across the Southern African region, which is where I'm going to be focusing uh, this afternoon. So again, it, you know, it's like within uh, the sites of possibility that have been created by many centuries of struggle and resistance and dreaming, dreaming and imagining ourselves um, in, in contradiction to the, the narrative of hate and race and, and subordination and otherness, out of this has arrived this place that we have created, that we have imagined and birthed many through death. So uh, 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 I remember the moment or when I had this insight, this like a, it was a, yeah, I think, I think all intellectuals have these moments. It's like a eureka moment when suddenly, you know, something happens inside your head. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, you know, a little, it's like the window opens and a little fresh breeze uh, blows in. And, and I was thinking about how to move myself out of the, gendered nationalist movements, what we call the women's movements in Southern Africa across the continent, where I'd gotten stuck and where I was struggling with a battle against me, vilification, other women, very similar to what the patriarchs we had been doing. And I couldn't understand what had happened here. And so I needed to lean back. And I used the notion of leaning back really as a way of intellectually just giving yourself a breathing space. And then I realized that actually who I was had become, was coming out of these millions and millions of lives of beautiful humans in this region who had fought against the hatefulness of colonialism. And here was this, this gift that I had been bequeathed and that I could apply it to myself as a woman who struggles for her freedom. And then I could take a step back from the nationalist gendered movements. And that's what I did. So these little stepping stones that one finds within this uh, very, very powerful moment we have created through our resistances. So let me, let me and I, I often say in my writing and in my conversations that my subjectivities are critical resources for me to, to not only position myself in the moment uh, of discourse or of life, but also they are, they are the sources of radical uh, nonconformity for me. And so I always refer to myself. I always refer to Patricia. And I have several selves, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, Patricia is the most radical of, <laughs> of the selves who inhabit this black body that I love so much and that I'm going to try and live in for at least another 30 years till I make a century. So for me, the notion of contemporarity reflects the search for new epistemological tools and universes whereby I can initiate some of the following possibilities. First of all, to separate myself from nationalism and engage nationalism as an ideology of mass resistance, but which has reached its, it has reached its, its end, it, it, it's depassé. You know, it's no longer functioning for us in this moment where we, we, we have to become contemporary because all around us, human life has become contemporary, is becoming contemporary. So to separate myself from nationalism and to engage in the critique of how nationalism has defined and dominated women's politics and feminist politics, particularly in our 
on our continent and specifically in our region. So that is one of the, the searches that contemporary as a notion that I offer, I am not marking it you know, with my individual identity and therefore, you know, Patricia uh, coined this notion. No, 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 I don't like that. I don't operate in that, in that universe. It is a gift that I'm putting out in the radical universe to say, here's what I, I find is helping me to think in new ways. So this separating of myself from nationalism is something that I have felt as an instinct for a long time that I experienced in terms of the rejection in the nationalist gendered women's movements and which I am now am embarking on because I know this series uh, invites us to think of, to speak about the new ideas, the new work that we are doing or that we anticipate engaging in. The second thing that contemporarity as a notion, as a possibility, as a gift to myself uh, offers me is that I can lean back from the women's movements, which now have largely been integrated into the state at national levels and into the UN at the uh, so-called global level, which is a capitalist notion. And then I can also engage in a critique of the gendered women's movements. And this, is, uh, this has elicited a lot of resentment, a lot of rejection, a lot of resistance from um, women whom I've traveled with for four decades in some instances. But my, my point is this, we can't stay in the same place and we cannot become the things that others want us to become. We always have to be reshaping and redefining ourselves. And in those ways, we can actually not only move ourselves forward in time, which is of course an illusion because time doesn't move forward, it exists in and of itself, but in the human mind, we do move forward. We do have notions uh, like progress, you know, like advancement, et cetera. And so in those narrow corridors of thinking of ourselves as moving forward, I, I, uh, I, I really am armed with the critique. The critique is a resource, um, a gift that I have inherited from left politics, from radical politics, from some of the most beautiful humans who have lived on this planet, who love freedom and who have left us beautiful legacies uh, that uh, enable us to find our courage. Because one of the things that's happened with the left or with people who name themselves progressive or who say they are not of the status quo is that we have forgotten that we have courage. So for me, leaning back and critiquing nationalism, uh, whether it's about those who occupy the state who are largely male um, or those who are associated with the state through their movements and through their personal relationships, that critique is central to recrafting um, the discourses, um, the epistemologies that are going to enable us um, to, to, to create new, new and different societies. The third point is to re redefine my political identity as a feminist. So contemporarity challenges me because once I become contemporary in my feminism, then, and I critique nationalism and I recognize that nationalism has defined African feminism in particular ways and African women's politics in certain ways, it's like an umbilical cord that has to be cut. So once I cut it, I leave behind in the nationalist basket, the adjectives that describe me in particular ways. And one of them, which I'm removing systematically is that I don't describe myself as an African feminist. I describe myself as a feminist, a, a radical eco-feminist. I'm black, it's obvious. And I live on the continent. I work on the continent, particularly in Southern Africa. Those are details that I attach. But I don't want to be identified and known and called by an adjective that is deeply problematical in terms of its uh, construction and meanings. What do I mean? Nationalists have imbued the notion of being African with deep-seated feudal resonances that perpetuate the persistence of practices 
and that also uh, hem us in as black women on this continent so that we have to be African in particular ways. In fact, we're the only group who name ourselves African feminists and, and couple our feminism with our uh, continental uh, identity, you know? Other people say, yes, I'm a feminist, I live in India, you know, I'm Indian, uh, or I'm a feminist, I live in Europe. But we are, it's almost like an obsession, like it's like a bloodstream issue. <laughs> and even when people describe you, she's an African feminist. Why can't you say I'm an African uh, or I'm a feminist who lives in Africa? It's obvious. <laughs> well, maybe not because the colonial lineage is lurking around my name, Patricia McFadden. Many people insist that I'm a white woman <laughs> until they actually hear me speak or see me. It's a it's a, an, a, an area of contestation, of course, and, uh, and also I often become I'm often othered by uh, Africans who believe that they represent the authentic phenotype, um, and of course play into the colonial stereotype uh, and the trope that you know to be African you have to be a certain thing that looks in a certain way and speaks in a certain way. And I reject all of that. And I think it's a conversation that we really do need to, to have. And I'm hoping that by separating African from my feminism, I will also um, stimulate the conversation about how, you know, the, the issue of appearance and, um, and who can be African, who cannot. But why I'm doing this is because I wanna provoke a larger conversation about uh, the ways in which black men in particular um, uh, have, who call themselves progressive, who speak decoloniality, who are actually very committed to the discourses of decoloniality and uh, deconstructing you know, uh, the, the, the whole infrastructure of colonialism have resisted uh, feminist knowledge. Uh, continue to treat it as peripheral to their own development, their own understandings of who they are and who we are as an African people. And this large and growing genre of vital, radical knowledge that we need to be able to actually move the needle forward for us as Africans, those of us who are not embedded in systems that enable us to live these lives of overconsumption, to plunder, you know, and to exercise violence uh, 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 against the majority of Africans. Those of us who claim that we are not them, uh, we have to, especially male scholars, have to bring themselves to the table, the feminist table, and recognize that it is actually feminism that, um, uh, that uh, encompasses most of the new possibilities. I'm saying most because when male intellectuals who wear the label, label of radicalism claim that they are different and they don't participate in the radical discourses that feminists bring to the commons, then um, uh, they are missing from the conversation. They are losing out. And we are not exotica. We are not intellectual exotica. We are not, you know, um, these characters that have to be abided until they stop talking, until they finish, you know, or whose work has to be reinterpreted and restated by the established male, black male scholars. No, we don't want that. We don't want you to do to ask what whites have been doing to Africans for many centuries. Don't take my voice, listen to it, um, show respect and learn and grow. Because I can tell you that I know the core principles of black male radical scholarship on this continent. I know it, I know them. I traveled for 40, 50 years in that community and I embrace it. And I reference the scholarship of many, many black male intellectuals, Cabral, everybody, Sankara, but 
I'm waiting for my brothers to embrace our work, not just in terms of pampering us and flattering us, but actually to show respect and to use our work so that we can collectively move to a, a new place. So for me, contemporarity is not only embedded you know, in the personal experience of searching for new epistemologies of the South, but it's also embedded in the legacies of resistance of Black people across Southern Africa and continentally. It draws from the specific energies of anti-colonialism which have shaped and defined Southern Africa as a liberation struggle zone. It also is about the consciousness on my part of the unique resistance legacies of the struggles I was part of. For example, I left Swaziland as a reservation a feudal reservation which is now imploding. Um, and um, it was, as I said earlier on, a, a recognition that I actually have been crafted in this, in this furnace of resistance of the region, that who I am doesn't come out of my head. It's really a reflection of my, I'm lucky that I was born at a moment, at a conjuncture where so many of these legacies of resistance converged in liberation movements and in women's movements. And it's also in a wider sense, it is uh, the notion of uh, contemporary is about excavating the epistemic and radical possibilities, which the liberatory shift provided by daring to challenge the holy cows of nationalism and feudal colonial patriarchies. So there are two scenarios in the region. Um, there are the liberatory discourses, which were used as mobilizing and creative tools and opportunities towards freedom. And these inform the radical energies that the notion of contemporary brings to the table of radical discourse. On the other side, there is, of course, the practice of state occupancy and plunder, accumulation, by state-based and corporate elites. And in the pieces that I write in these past few years, I'm actually trying to weave together not only recognitions of where we come from, but also uh, critiques of where we want to go. So um, as women, let me just summarize by saying as women, we were central to the radical impetuses of anti-colonialism. And we were actually in the forefront of crafting new imaginaries of freedom and lives of dignity. And Cabral, for example, recognizes this in his work. It's muted, of course. You really have to read him very intimately, very closely with love, and then you find the resonances. And almost all the pictures uh, of Cabral He's surrounded by comrades who are mainly women. And it's, uh, people said, oh, but you are born and you're in game. He was a man who loved women. He was a playboy and all that. <laughs> and of course, what that does is that it shifts the lens to the sexualized representations of women as sources of sexual pleasure for men. And you miss the point that Cabral shines, he gets his light from having actually released his patriarchal inhibitions and embraced the energies of women because we are the oldest resistors in the human society. We have been fighting patriarchy from the moment it emerged. You know, we have insisted that humans are most beautiful when we are free, when we love each other, when we care for it. And this is not because in the scheme of nature, we are the ones who birth. No, I think that's just a coincidence. I think in the, in the, in the, the, the um, invention of who we are as women and, and as we've lived it, we show that it's much more than just having breasts and, and uteruses. It's really about the quintessential instincts that humans are imbued with within the universe and that we are really, I mean, this is why we are here to explore and celebrate who we are. And as women, we have consistently shared this. 
mirrored it to human society. So um, someone like Cabral, he's so gorgeous because he resonates that. You can tell that he's, he's a man who acknowledges and grows from the beauty and the creativity of women's intellect. And I invite you to go back and, and, and read Return to the Source because I read that, that title in many ways. Returning to the source, not only the source of revolution, but really the source of human knowledge and human beauty and human courage, which is his relationship with his, women, his female comrades. And they didn't, by the way, they didn't betray him. Now, we could have a conversation about this, I know. I, uh, I often make uh, my friends, uh, my colleagues uh, un unhappy about this. And they start, they say, I, they accuse me of essentializing men, but I'm not doing that. I'm pointing to a necessity of leaving your little cage, your patriarchal cage, and to open your arms wide and embrace the totality of human knowledge and creativity and women are very central to that. We have also, as women changed, I mean, if you look at our journey in the human narrative, uh, we've changed in many ways, in many ways, in many, in many moments, and we continue to change. Uh, so then I, I use the notion of becoming. And for me, this transforming of ourselves all the time throughout the human narrative, you know, is what, what uh, uh, enables us to arrive at this conjuncture um, at feminism. That feminism is a reflection of our becoming and it's also a refusal to compromise on the non-negotiables, integrity, dignity, complete personhood, and the right to choose who we are, who we become. Intellectually, I would like to end by saying that intellectually, contemporarity challenges both neoliberal colonial discourses and the persistence of Africanist pseudo exceptionalism. And it is really an issue that I'm, I'm sort of chewing on and nibbling uh, on. And also I really sometimes chaff at the bit about this issue because I've, I've not been able to encourage, to invite my colleagues, especially those who have left the reservation of gender, gender studies or gender whatever, and, and who name themselves feminists. I'm saying to them, yes, let's interrogate feudalism. Let's disrupt this cozy relationship between the neocolonial state elites and the ancient vicious feudalists who keep the majority of African women caged in the rural areas. They are chiefs, they are kings, they are all these old fossilized nasty hierarchies and infrastructures of power. Uh, which are perpetuated and protected by a, no, a, a notion and a practice of African feudal exceptionalism, as though feudalism didn't exist anywhere else. You know, so we need to challenge that. And then, of course, I've already touched on this issue of decoloniality, which I think, and I've challenged a couple of my colleagues, um, it remains within nationalism, and which is essentially conservative and sexist. We can have a conversation about that. I hope somebody uh, raises this issue because I also need to think about it. I'm thinking by myself and around myself on this, but I know that although it's still a, at, a, at a stage of instinct, I just feel bored, you know, by this decoloniality discourse because it just recycles and moves in a circle all the time. And I often will say to a colleague, just say something new, just leave the reservation. Just say something new, you know, because it's this, it, it, it's this comfort zone that uh, uh, perpetuates many of the repressive forms that we are struggling with. So the notion of contemporarity challenges black male intellectuals who claim to be forward looking, to read feminist work with respect and serious consideration, to initiate personal and social shifts by rejecting patriarchal privilege, to engage in debates and conversations with radical feminists, not gendered nationalists, those are safe and they pose no real challenge. But when you engage with radical feminists, then you move beyond 
the nationalist constrained and tired arguments about coloniality. And my final final is that feminist contemporarity is a challenge to black women to find the courage to become feminist and contemporary through new discourses and critiques of nationalism and patriarchy and to in envision new alternative selves and societies. Because I know many of my sisters are scared of actually living their feminism. We've gotten to the point where they are declaring themselves as feminists, which was something that was not done 20 years ago or 30 years ago when I was naming myself feminist, the women would run under the table and hide. Now I hear women declare themselves <laughs> feminist, I'm feminist. I'm... So I'm like, okay, now the work begins. Now make the critique and leave behind the ancient feudal identities. And that's a scary place to leave because now you have to reconstruct, redefine, recalibrate yourself and the backlash is swift. You will, be, um, you will be attacked, but it's worth it because then you learn how to fight and you relish the glory of winning. <laughs> Let me stop there because I could go on and on and I know that I've gone way beyond the time and I'm enjoying my own voice, which is really a weakness. <laughs> But I've had a wonderful time. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to pleasure myself. <laughs> I hope that I have pleased you too. Uh, yes, indeed. Thank you for, for the breathtaking uh, presentation. I'll now yield the uh, digital floor to Sifri uh, to pose a couple of questions. And um, Colleagues, you're also welcome to post your comments and chat, um, uh, questions on the chat function. Sinfrey, the floor is yours. Uh, you you're, you're muted. I was um, muted by ecofeminism. Okay. Uh, let me respond to one or two issues that you raised. I want you to help me clarify my thinking on this. Is your argument, um, I'm talking now as a radical scholar who doubles once in a while in decoloniality. Is your argument that male decolonial scholars are sexist? Is that the core of the argument? or that they are so frightened of, femi of, of feminism that they can't engage with it. Or let me put it differently. If you were in my position and were advising me on how to handle feminism uh, taking off from the stage of decoloniality, what would you say I should do? <clears throat> Uh, can I respond to you? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, you can. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, actually all the things that you've said besides the last one are together. Uh -huh. They reflect exactly the point I'm making uh -huh. that, you know, sexism is not, it's like, it's when we, when we say to people who say, I'm not racist, I don't use racist language. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, that you're missing the point. Uh -huh. Racism is institutionalized privilege. Yes. That experience uh, through the uh, occupancy of a white body. Yeah. So we experience the exclusion uh -huh. that you, that the privilege of that that racism gives to white people. It's the same thing with being male yes. and uh, you know uh, being terrified. Like like white people are saying. Excuse me, I'm jumping around. The white people are saying, for example, in the US, tell me, explain to me after the summer of uh, Black Lives Matter, explain to me, you know, what, what do I need to do? What must I do? And black people get really upset about this. We do, because we're like, you are the one who actually needs to do that work. Don't ask me, 
to do the work to free yourself from your privilege. You need to take yourself to a new place where you interrogate the fact that you are privileged by your whiteness. So we apply the same principle to maleness because men know that they are privileged by patriarchy. They know that they are, when they, uh, for example, engage in these discourses of decoloniality, that they are not bringing feminist discourses and knowledge to the conversation. They're saying the same thing they've been saying since the moment of independence, which is 60 years ago in many of our societies, you know? So it's really not my responsibility to educate men or a man uh -huh. about what it means hmm, to speak to the alternative, to imagine the alternative. Because this moment is about mm -hmm. creating the alternative as radical people, as progressive people, people who do not associate themselves with the status quo. And I know where my inadequacies are. I know what, for example, uh, I need to do to unlearn nationalism because I spent mm -hmm. 40 years in the nationalist movement mm -hmm. learning to be anti-colonial from a nationalist male perspective. And by resisting that, that masculinity in nationalism, I was able to begin to speak about women's rights, about women's bodies, about the integrity of women. It's a long journey. It's taken me many, many decades. But I'm now at a point where I can actually say that I'm living my feminism. Mm -hmm. So embracing feminism is about liberating yourself intellectually as well as personally from the privilege of being male. And just to, to add on, you see, part of the conundrum for black men, and this I would explain to you if you, as you asked me, what would I say to you? Yeah. <laughs> What the conundrum is this? Black men have become accustomed to thinking that oppressive systems um, are only associated with race and class and not with gender. So they separate themselves from the, the gendered relationships that they have with black women and they think about race as uh, being about themselves in relation to whites, you see. But it's much more than that, because that's why the notion of intersectionality, which of course is become, has become appropriated and, you know, so messed up and so, <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, it's a shame really. And I, I personally will not even try to retrieve it, but I try to use it in the most radical ways. That's why intersectionality is so important. And so few of the decolonialists, for example, uh, use intersectionality. You know, they position themselves on this old, old intellectual trope of, you know, talking about colonialism and the black man as though that's the be all and end all of what it means to be a black person. It's not. There are many, many dimensions to it. So I'd say to you, you know, Sintri, just free yourself. You, the, you are the one who knows how to free yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can give me your freedom. Freedom is an instinct. In the piece that Chanel mentioned about uh, women in African socialist projects, which is, uh, which uh, by the way, is stuck right now because the Oxford uh, research, um, uh, uh, Oxford, what is it called? Oxford Encyclopedia, Research Encyclopedia. Um, uh, they want me to make certain changes to the piece and I don't want to. And I, so, I, so I'm taking my piece back. I'm taking my piece back. I won't, you know, I, it's my work. It's, 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 it's a lovely piece of work. It's radical and uh, they can't handle it. So they shouldn't have asked me, you know, they should have gone to Wikipedia and they should have read the stuff before they <laughs> invited me to write the piece. So the point is, in there, I speak about the instinct of freedom, that nobody can free you, as we all know, except yourself. And when you have a radical consciousness, 
even as a man, as a, a woman, as a black person, whatever, that radical consciousness is your leaping stone into a new future, into a new possibility. You, you will only benefit, you won't lose by freeing yourself from patriarchal privilege. This is what we need from our brothers. We need them to take responsibility, to be accountable for the privilege that they are, and to stop reproducing these ancient repressive discourses that feed the notion of African feudal exceptionalism. It needs to just let it go. And when you let it go, then you begin a new journey. That's what I would say. So the sexism is linked to the privilege. It's linked to the hierarchies, the, 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 the really corrupt and constrained notions of respect, you know, that a woman must respect a man, that you, these things. And often intellectuals pretend like they don't actually uh, do this. Like, uh, you know, I'm not like that peasant who's sitting under a tree and wants his oppressed wife to bring him a, 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 a calabash of, of wine. No, it's just the form that's different. <laughs> but you guys do it and you uh, you benefit from it. You know, when you go kumusha, you know, it's back to food. <laughs> uh, and it's so nice. Uh? So these are the things that we need to interrogate to engage with as intellectuals, to find the new words, the new language, the new epistemologies, and not just to infuse decoloniality, but to actually uh, 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 center feminism in the discourse on decoloniality, rather than saying, add feminism and stir. No. Okay. So you are saying that it is possible conceptually to come up with a project called a decolonial feminist project? No. No. I'm, no. I'm saying, I'm saying feminism is the ideology and the politics of the future. That uh -huh. is where, that is where the alternatives in terms of discourses, okay. that's where the possibilities are. So mm -hmm. once you embed yourself in feminist discourse, because it's the most inclusive of the discourses. Okay. And that's why I said, women are always becoming, because from the very beginning of human intellectual adventure, of this adventure, this journey, women have always centered inclusiveness. And feminism is a culmination of women's resistances to patriarchy. That's what feminism is. It's a politics of resistance to patriarchy. If you are a beneficiary of patriarchy through your maleness, uh, then you need to move yourself to a feminist discursive epistemology. Okay. So let, let me see differently then. You are saying that feminism is tomorrow. It's today. Yesterday. Today. Okay. Feminism is today and tomorrow. <laughs> Decoloniality is yesterday. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Itolo, itolo. <laughs> okay. I never thought I was. This is what you see. I never thought I was so conservative and ancient, but anyway. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what I'm saying is, leave the cave. The sunshine is good for you. It's good for your bones <laughs> and it's good for your mind. Step out of the patriarchal cave. It's so good for you and for all those whom you love and who love you. Yeah. You know, that's what freedom is about. Mm, that's true. I think for the sake of uh, reducing my patriarchal load, I'll stop asking and give over to Basi so that other people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chanel has uh, suggested. Chanel has asked a question. Uh, I don't know what you want to do, Basi. Okay, so let me um, uh, comment, <laughs> make a couple of comments. Uh, so, again, thank you very much. Um, Grace and Desiree are really very appreciative of your talk. And uh, uh, there's a question from uh, Gabriel Nascimento. Um, Gabriel, would you like to pose your question? 
Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, right. Professor Brown. Yeah. Thank you. I speak from Brazil. I'm a professor, uh, I could say junior professor uh, at the Federal University in Southern Bahia, Brazil. And uh, thank you very much, Prof uh, uh, Patricia, for your inspiring presentation and talk. Uh, you have much to, to talk about what we live now in Brazil concerning this kind of questioning and people questioning the, the way uh, Black feminists are taking the, their stand on, on uh, public context uh, for what we, we are discussing here. And uh, recently we have been, uh, we have seen attacks against those feminists, black scholars uh, in Brazil who are advocating for the locus of speech. And of course, many white people in Brazil specifically, uh, not those who support the government of our uh, new liberal President Bolsonaro, of course, but leftist people who, who uh, uh, of course, we, we could say that they, they would be uh, our uh, allies, our uh, people uh, supporting the, the movement, the black, uh, black movement, our anti-racist agenda. But they, uh, they are the ones to provoke and to question the locus of speech of those women who are speaking in Brazil. So uh, there's, there's something that because they say that uh, they, uh, they don't have to speak or, or struggle against racism because now it's, a, it's the case for black people. How, how do you see this interplay that we have between the locus of speech that's now seen on, uh, within the, uh, the vision that it, it's uh, reserved for black people? <laughs> because they, the whites are with this kind of white ex exceptionalism and saying that they don't have to speak about ra racism or to struggle against racism. And the locus of enunciation of white people or white communities, because I know that sometimes when, when you speak about the future, we are stuck uh, in the present. That, that's the problem that the, the present for us uh, in Brazil specifically is, is stuck in the past of slavery in a country where uh, most of people are black or mestizos or uh, living under, under racist conditions that we know. For example, with extreme poverty, the existence of black women, uh, most, most black, black most, most workers on, under bad positions are black women, for example. So how do you see this interplay? Because I know we have to, to question the whites to disavow, to, uh, of course, uh, take the responsibility because they, they don't take this, uh, of course. So thank you very much for such an inspiring talk. Thank you, Professor Marconi, Professor Bessie, and Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Professor Bassi, can I respond? Yes, please, please. Yes. So, so um, I'm going to try and uh, respond as much as I understood. It's such a beautiful question, and thank you so much. Uh, what was the, uh, the, the speaker's name? Uh, Gabriel. Gabriel. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, because Brazil lies in our souls. Uh, Bahia, in particular, lives in our souls as Africans who remained on the continent. And the, the, the nodes and the ties are so deep and so, uh, you know, they can never be undone. We, we don't want them to be undone. We, we, we you know, uh, we are all of us. And so as he was speaking, I was trying to take myself there. Um, and uh, yes, we are at a very interesting conjuncture and in, in the human, uh, 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 um, moment of contestations uh, where, because like I said, we have insisted on our dignity, even when it seemed intractable, we have been able actually to begin to move the great stone as the sisters of the Caribbean would put it. You know, we are beginning to shift the great boulder that has crushed 
has been lying on our backs and holding us down. So the issues of race are at the core of white privilege, of colonialism, of slaving, of dehumanization, et cetera. And they really lie at the core of whiteness and who white people are. And so when they react, when they engage in knee jerk um, uh, uh, protestations, or when they couch their protestations in, in uh, uh, bleeding liberal terms, like I'm your friend, but you know, uh, you really shouldn't be uh, uh, calling me because I, I'm, already, I'm not racist or, you know, uh, what else do you want? Because, you know, you can speak about racism and how oppressed you are. Nobody's stopping you anymore. You don't have a chain around your neck. Those kinds of expressions, which are really about uh, uh, how uh, uh, undone the work is in white consciousness about their privilege. So we have to always remember that on one level, uh, our white allies remain white and they are uh, uh, privileged by whiteness. And so the consciousness of uh, anti-racism doesn't necessarily overthrow the infrastructures of racist privileging. It's the same thing with being a black man who says, I support women's freedoms, but that does not transform the relationships of power and exploitation. And it does not change the discourses of sexism, you know, and uh, suppression and subordination between us as uh, uh, women and men who live in black bodies. So I would say that what uh, Gabriel has posed to us is a very fine and very um, uh, uh, crucial uh, uh, intellectual issue that we face all the time. In South Africa, we face exactly the same issue. It's like a gray line that, it, that comes up all the time. And then, you know, the, the black people are expected to occupy the gray space so that we can accommodate white fragility. So we become a buffer to the necessity of whites dealing with the facts about how they became who they are whether they are right-wing or whether they espouse left-wing politics. So it, it is an, a, a, an issue that we are going to have to deal with in a more concerted and focused and courageous way. Um, and Brazil offers us many, many uh, beautiful opportunities to also think about ourselves as Africans living on this continent in, in ways that go beyond the continental the continentality of our land space. You know, um, Tiambe Zeleza has done this beautiful, beautiful historical work about the journeys that the human intellectual narrative has encompassed across time and space and who we have become and how we have become the Africans that we are everywhere you know, everywhere across the world. And, and so we need to, to enrich ourselves with all the gems that African intellectuals bring to the table, to the common buffet of African intellectualism. But we also must maintain the sharpness of the critique, especially that one that requires that we go beyond the discourses of anti-colonialism and decoloniality as inspired by nationalism, you know, and to explore the possibilities of the new ways of speaking about ourselves. We mustn't, of course, we cannot leave the hierarchies of power behind because they are in our lives in, in almost every way, but really by crafting the new intellectual imaginaries, we do begin to uh, open the pathways for, 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 for the creation of new types of societies. 
So I'm not responding to Gabriel's question because it's so deep and so gorgeous and it requires so many, 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 many <laughs> radical minds. And thank you, but I hope that it will continue to travel in the, in the radical community. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, Busi would like to share some thoughts on the presentation as well. Busi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Patricia, for a very wonderful talk. I am very grateful that you did uh, say what you said because I have thought of some of the things that you said but uh, never had the audacity to say them publicly because I'm not as uh, maybe as strong and as carefree as you are. But I'm grateful, especially when you point out about radical African male scholars and their continued stay in the cave while at the same time they call themselves highly progressive. That is something that we experience every day, especially for me, I am in African studies and I, I experience uh, the caveman mentality almost uh, every day of my working life. Just to digress a bit, uh, Sinfri asked a question and said, uh, in your presentation, are you suggesting that African uh, male radical scholars are sexist? I would like to answer that question uh, by saying this, if we have racist without racism, or, or no, if we have racism without racist, how is, well, I think it is also possible to have um, sexism without sexist. So you can deduce yourself what that, what that means. My last point is uh, something that Patricia, you mentioned on decoloniality uh, scholarship. And you're often you're, um, thinking that, why can't they say something more? We have heard this. I also, risk, uh, maybe two months ago, made a comment to somebody that um, what, whenever I read about decolonial scholarship, I am struck by the fact that feminists have long been writing about these ideas, but none of these male radical scholars, the decolonial scholars, are even, are even um, citing the work of those feminists that wrote a long time ago about the very same ideas. But now that the champions of decoloniality scholarship are male, it does seem as if these ideas are now presented as novel, as new and all that. So for me, that has always uh, struck me. I have never had the audacity to publicly say so. But at least today, you gave me a little bit of uh, nerve to say uh, that, yeah, I have felt that you know feminist scholarship is uh, done a disservice by these decolonial scholars. Thank you. Thank you, my sister. And a welcome to the community of radical, courageous women, indomitable, unstoppable. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Speak your word, speak your word, <laughs> you know, and, and you are strong. It's just that Patricia uh, hasn't invested in some of the infrastructures of patriarchy. So I live alone, um, you know, I, I, I don't have to accommodate certain uh, negotiations. So I, my freedom is broad and wide and deep, you see. And it's a choice that I made, but you, we make different choices. But as you say, you know, the voice can be spoken regardless of where we are located. It's, yeah. it's, it's about speaking our voice, you know? And I love it that you have actually broadened this issue about the, the, the ways in which the coloniality pretends to be uh, a cutting edge when actually it is drawing from the work yes. of radical feminists in particular yes. on the continent. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, this scenario happened with feminism generally. Foucault, for example, Foucault literally milked feminism, milked feminism, published these tons and tons of texts, you know, using feminist logic, epistemologies, radical ideas, 
he just tweaked them and tweaked them and tweaked them. And then, and you know, um, Rosemary Hennessy has this beautiful book on materialism and feminism. And in there, she shows the ways in which Foucault just plundered feminist uh, uh, philosophy, feminist text, uh, uh, insights, and never acknowledged. And it's this plundering, because we often think about plunder as capitalism plundering the black body, you know, as a colonial coming from Europe and plundering our resources, but plunder is very central to systems of oppression. Plunder is at the core of patriarchy. It's what makes privilege possible. So to become this great uh, decolonial scholar, you just plunder the ideas of black women because it's inherent in your status as a privileged human who is living in a, a male body. And in this case, he happens to be black. So exposing it. Please do write a piece, my sister. Write a piece about this. Because the whole point is not to complain, but to actually pose the intellectual challenge to our allies, to our compatriots, to our brothers, you see, our colleagues. Write it. The power of the text, girl. <laughs> yeah, so, but thank you, thank you. It's lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, Chanel, uh, would you like to pose your question? Okay, so Chanel says, um, thank you for a wonderful presentation, wonderful in caps. <laughs> <laughs> Can you please talk a little bit more about African feminism versus being a feminist in Africa. So African feminism versus being a feminist in Africa. How do we then distance ourselves, I, I guess, uh, from the continent of Africa, from the dominance of Western feminism, which seems to dominate the feminist imagination? Yes. Okay, so um, there's a false bogey at the, in the second half of Chanel's uh, uh, question. Because once you go to the place that says Western feminism is dominating feminism, then you get trapped in a discourse that actually doesn't come out of the feminist movement. It comes out of the nationalist movement and the backlash against feminism that claims that black women who say they are feminist are actually mimicking white women that feminism is not uh, natural to Africans and that, you know, it's an imposition, it's a colonial uh, uh, imposition. So it, you get trapped, you get locked into, uh, what's it called? There's, a, there's an expression for it in the academy, but it's a false, it's a false um, uh, sort of claim that appears to be quite, um, you know, substantial and, uh, to have legitimacy, but it actually is it's like a box with a, a suitcase with a false bottom, with a, with a false face. So then you get trapped there. So the important thing is to distance yourself from those traps, which are actually set by nationalists. I had that thrown at me many, many times in my lifetime as a feminist. And I had to think about it really, because when it's first thrown at you, that you know, you. Your feminism is actually a white uh, uh, hegemonic uh, discourse that comes out of white, white women appropriating the voices of black women. Then what happens is that there's a conflation of the black man dismissing what you are saying and with a, a real problem that black women have faced where white women, because they are white and privileged have actually if for a very long time usurped our voices and spoken for us. So if you disaggregate or dis dis disaggregate these two points, then you can deal with them separately. But it doesn't take away from the fact that feminism everywhere in human societies is the culmination of a politics of resistance that women have engaged in since the moment of surplus production. 
when women became the first commodity, when women's bodies were recognized as the source of wealth, as the source of power, as the source of multiplicity. We work, we breed, we create, we provide services. And of course, the, the equivalence being drawn between our bodies and those of other living beings like cows, like yaks, like goats, you know, and you know what equivalence, the, the function of equivalence in the creation of commodity of the commodity economy, you know, uh, the, the, the exchange, the distinction between use value and exchange value. So the first expressions of exchange value actually occur within the human family unit where women are then commodified because of their features, their unique features, natural features. And these features actually allow for the accumulation and the plunder of the female body. And of course you have your polygyny, which is of course multiple female bodies. And you can, nobody can argue with me that I'm wrong when we talk about the function of polygyny, for example, in earlier human societies where men who were successful had many wives. And in our society here in Eswatini, the most successful male has 15 wives right now and counting. His father had 100. These are displays of, you know, the, 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 the value, the, the, the wealth of the male. It goes back in, this, in all the society. So women have struggled against it. In spite of the narratives that say women learned how to accommodate it, women, for example, uh, I love um, uh, Usman Semben, I love him. And I love Her Three Days. If you've never read Her Three Days, you should read it together with Ama'ata Edu's uh, book against polygamy. Can somebody help me remember what Ama'ata Edu's uh, uh, book is, uh, where she, she, critiques, uh, um, she critiques polygamy. Um, it's a novel, a very in, in, important novel. It's After Sister Kill Joy. Uh, if, if somebody remembers, please remind me about it. So, but, uh, but uh, 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 Osman Semben uh, speaks to this and most people actually think that he's romanticizing uh, uh, and, and he's celebrating women's skills and abilities to navigate the marital terrain that, you know, polygamy is or polygyny is possible when women understand that each of them can have power but actually what Samben is saying is that this is the most fundamental expression of the degradation of women's integrity. Because to own a, another human being is to actually degrade yourself in the, in the most fundamental way. I mean, how can you own another human? But we see it, these expressions of private property as they emerge in the human family unit, which is the earliest and the oldest family unit and the most resilient site of patriarchy. We see it there. So we have to remember that many of the discourses that we encounter in this moment are linked with ancient arguments and pushbacks and pull forwards that women have insisted they are complete human beings and men have insisted that they cannot be. That they can only be what men say they can be because the men control the power. You see, the sources of production and the woman's body is the critical source of production. So once we separate those, we then, Chanel, can speak about feminism as a collective legacy run through by many, many changes, a love story. Thank you, Tommaso, thank you. So feminism is a narrative common to all women of resistance against patriarchy everywhere it emerged. It's a universal system of oppression. It's not unique to Europeans. That is a nationalist backlash to say that it's, it never existed in Africa. It did, it's all, in fact, it starts here because <laughs> we have the oldest, you know, we, uh, we proclaim, we're so proud and we celebrate the fact that humans evolved in Africa. We are the oldest humans. We, everybody's an African, blah, 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 blah. And then we turn around and say, but uh, patriarchy is a European invention. Hello, we have the oldest societies. 
And in the older societies, patriarchy is the most entrenched. You see, <laughs> because it goes with that, you see. So let me go to the second part quickly. It, this is an area that I really get excited about. I apologize for just going on and on and on and I, going on many little routes. <laughs> so uh, the issue of separating my Africanness from my feminism is that I'm not separating it. I'm just distant, distancing it. I love being a, um, an African. I'm an African. I am. I mean, Tabo spoke to me in many, many ways in that poem, you know, of the early 1990s, even though <laughs> I don't think he actually lived the poem in many ways in the policies of his government and extra like that. I've had this conversation with him several times. But I love that poem because it positions the fact that we love who we are. We love ourselves. We love being humans who are African in spite of all the atrocities that have been committed by us. To, uh, committed against us by others. So I'm distancing my Africanness as an adjective so that I can broaden and widen my feminism as a lived identity. I live as an African, but my feminism is something that I've given to myself. I was born on this continent in a black skin, you know, and I love it, but I was not born feminist. It's an identity that I've given myself and I don't want to conflate it into my Africanness. I want a distance. It's, it's a heuristic strategy that I'm using because I need to explore my feminism. I want to deepen and widen it. I want to paint it different colors. You know, I want to explore it as eco-feminism, as radical feminism, as I want to, for example, experience what happens to my feminism as I bring veganism to it, which is one of the things I'm working on now as a vegan. You know, what happens with my feminism? What can I bring to feminism as an activist, as an intellectual who loves being radical in the space of feminism? What can I bring from my experience of being an organic farmer as we fight against the destruction of our planet, our home. So these are all the intricacies and the dimensions that inform this distancing, this leaning back from given identities, established identities. And the other one is that, you know, when you conflate African and feminist, you become named by others, you become defined by others. They expect you to be certain things. And I've encountered this many times, for example, in the US, where um, uh, people sought to, um, to um, just assize me, to um, uh, sort of bring me back in line, um, that, you know, uh, expectation that an African feminist should speak about Africa and speak about herself in a certain way, you see. So these are the, some of the reasons why I am sort of opening the gap between African and feminist. And also, of course, um, feminism has become pluralized. That's another challenging issue. Why at this conjuncture are we talking about African feminisms, but we don't hear that plural, the pluralization when we talk about feminism in India, or when we talk about feminism in Europe. But suddenly it's very um, sort of, you know, um, fashionable to be talking about African feminisms. And I'm like, what is this? <laughs> what are the ideological and epistemological implications of pluralizing it, you know? So th there are many conversations that need to be had. I am only, introducing one conversation that directly impacts on my subjective experience um, and expression and articulation of feminism as a life choice. I hope I responded to Chanel, at least in a certain way. Chanel, I need to write an article specifically for you. <laughs> wow, what, what a privilege. <laughs> um, 
uh, there are two, three more questions. Uh, but before I take the one by Desmond, let's take the one from um, Hilary uh, Jans. She asks uh, as follows. If we are unable to escape structured inequalities of race, gender, and so on, as well as the discourses that accompany them, how do you imagine the possibilities for change? Well, actually, I've escaped them. <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> I mean, we cannot be trapped in structures of oppression. This is the point that I've been making for an hour and a half, is that, you know, by, for example, embedding our discourses in feminism, we learn that nobody can chain you. Nobody can keep your freedom away from you. You're born free. The children use this expression. Oh, we are born free in South Africa. We're, no, I'm actually using it in a deeply philosophical way. Resisting the infrastructures of power is basically the raison d'etre for us being radical, for us persisting and insisting that we will struggle, that we will create an alternative. You know, it's only those who are benefiting from the infrastructures of oppression who feel that they cannot leave those infrastructures. But for us who've never been located in those infrastructures, especially that's why, you know, people talk about the black woman as the quintessential expression of freedom in all its essences, because we've never had power in the ways that all other humans in, of different colors and sexualities have had. So, you know, uh, with some of us, we go in, of course, but we are always uh, in the shadow of a man of some kind, you know. So, so uh, for me, the question doesn't arise actually. <laughs> you know, it's only those who are privileged by the infrastructure who would actually face that conundrum. So she wants to know, is it the same person? She wants to know how, how do we take change beyond the individual? First you change yourself. And then the, then mm. the change happens through your interaction because individuals, we have relationships directions, you know, communications, we live together, we do, we work together. All right. So the change starts with you. Who was it? Was it uh, Jimi Hendrix that said, be the change that you, that you seek? Okay. All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, Desmond, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Basi, and, and thank you, uh, Patricia, and everyone for this uh, stimulating conversation. I had asked uh, Basi to permit me to do, uh, engage in a conversation uh, with you briefly, and I make that request to others because I have a number of uh, forming and uh, you know, uh, scattering thoughts uh, that I'm hoping that in conversation with you maybe will um, uh, reorganize themselves in, in some meaningful ways. So I ask, I make these comments and ask these questions uh, as someone who was born of and raised of a matriarch among several other matriarchs. I also make these comments uh, as someone who uh, considers himself a student of decoloniality and also someone who considers himself a feminist and uh, someone who believes that it is not possible to have any meaningful or successful uh, decoloniality that is not also feminist. Yet, hearing your uh, comments or responses to seem free and uh, a number of other things you've uh, said, I think you've thrown my um, sense of uh, order, call it intellectual and ethical order, or moral order into a bit of a uh, question, uh, and this is part of why I want to uh, engage in this question. So the, the way I anchor my sense of, um, of resistance often begins with attempting to understand origins. 
it, it forces me to take history a bit more seriously. Now, when I hear you comment on this, it sounds to me like I'm understanding you to say that sexism um, is at the foundations or at least is, is central to uh, African origins or African history or the patriarchy is at the roots of, uh, of, of all of that. My exploration seems to uh, suggest something slightly different. And I want for you to help me think through how one can make better sense of it since it seems like I might have a, a confusion there. So I, I don't know that I've been able to come to a position where I think of the entire African continent from a position of um, organized ideas around gender. And I'm not referring here just to you know, parts of Africa that are matrilineal, uh, for instance, and there are several of them. I'm looking at uh, societies today that are patriarchal, that are fundamentally sexist in the ways that many institutions function. And in my attempt to understand those origins, I don't look at them in African traditions. I'll give you an example. Uh, you might be familiar with the work of um, Wando Achebe uh, in some part of what is today called Nigeria. Uh, by saying what is called Nigeria, perhaps you might sense I have some objections to that, uh, that notion. And this happens to be the region where I grew or where I was born and grew up. So I could understand a lot of what she was talking about in uh, her book, I had uh, books on this subject. But what Achebet attempts to, to document here is that when you look at the, the language, the religion, and several things that are indicators of this, these cultures and traditions, they did not, did not have anything that spoke to gender hierarchies until they encountered European missionaries. And you could see that change. To give you some specific example, for instance, the concept of God in this part of the, 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 the continent is, a, is genderless. Okay, um, both men and women have access to the same professions, the same education and so on and so forth. That will change as soon as they encountered Europe through missionaries and then of course uh, colonialism. And now when you talk to most people from that region, they will tell you, you know, men, women should be subversive to men because this is African tradition without understanding where that came from. This is also a part of Africa where the forces of Christianity coming from the Atlantic and the forces of Islam coming from the North clash. They collided at this particular spot. And I wonder to what extent this place might have been subject to these foreign religions that have built into them a sense of gender hierarchy. So I think my question then is, is it possible then that the work of decoloniality is actually attempting to rethink the multiplicities of ways that men and women have engaged with and challenged notion of gender hierarchies that have resulted in very different outcomes in different African societies. And that it is not necessarily the case that just being male or being from an African uh, uh, context from a traditional standpoint then presupposes the existence of gender hierarchy if we eliminate that factor of uh, imperialism. So that is just one, one part of it. I have three other issues that I'd like to raise, but this is at least one, one key area that I wanted to see if you can help me uh, better understand. Okay, uh, Desmond, you know, it's a whole conference um, <laughs> and uh, we don't have time. And also you've said many things. And uh, I often find that this is actually a strategy uh, with all due respect. This is a strategy that people use so that they don't have to actually uh, give as much time to what somebody is saying. Um, and they can always uh, project all the other stuff that they are carrying onto the discursive space and then not have to actually uh, process uh, what the conversation was about. With all due respect, you probably are not doing this, but you might be. So you see, you moved from saying that um, uh, you were raised in a context of matriarchy. Well, there are no matriarchies in Africa. There are no matriarchies. Matriarchy is an established, long enduring system where women not just don't just rule, but they have power. 
and, and they, they exercised that power across the societies. There were incidents of matriarchy, short-lived across our continent. Huh? And many of those incidences have left um, uh, bits, fragments in narratives, in some practices, in naming systems and things like that. But really, we cannot speak. I know Sheikh Anja Job provides the ground stone for a lot of the claims that African societies, especially in West Africa, were matriarchal, et cetera, et cetera. But you see, if you look at this whole genre of a backlash discourse to feminism, because it is actually a discourse that juxtaposes itself against feminism. Um, you see that there are, there, there are um, exaggerations, there are unsubstantiated, unsubstantiated claims that are made. And a lot of the stuff is interesting anthropological detail. It's important information for us to know in terms of where we come from as Africa, as Africans, for example, the story of Nigeria is complex and fabulous, fabulous, you know, anthropologically in terms of the, the, the novels and everything else. But Africa, uh, um, Nigeria is not Africa. Nigeria is one country in Africa. And often there's an extrapolation uh, of what has happened in Nigeria or what people think happened in Nigeria. It's then extrapolated intellectually across the continent and across the diaspora. And it, it, you know, when you watch it, when you view this from afar, you can see that it's happening. It's a conversation that is happening even amongst women who name themselves African feminists. I've had many of these engagements with my sisters. And uh, we don't have time, but the issues will, will stay with us. The journey, the issues will continue on this journey of, our, of ours as Africans, as we try to unravel who did what and how did we become who we have become in all the complex ways. So I, I you know, Another little slippage, it's just a little slippage, but it happens so quickly. But if you're not watching for it, you can actually get tripped up by it, is the conflation of matrilineality with matriarchy. You know, it's such a, such a, a swift little trick that is done. Matriarchy, matriarchal uh, societies and matrilineality are not the same thing. They're not. In some societies, there may have been moments or instances of matriarchy. In some societies, there may be remnants of matrilineality. For example, in Malawi, there are may, many uh, communities that have uh, matrilineal features. But we cannot, we cannot use those to rebut the feminist um, insistence all systems of oppression against women, regardless of what garb they are wearing, are embedded in the moment when women become the property of men. Whether that ownership is articulated in a brazen, uh, you know, public way or brazen way, or whether that ownership is hidden in practices that claim to be neutral or claim to be non-oppressive. But these are conversations that we've been having as Africans and they are wonderful, they're good for us because they help us to shift our intellectual lenses and our energies uh, and to return them to ourselves because we've been so preoccupied with what the whites have been doing to us for half a millennium. You know, that we, we've gotten stuck in those negative, vicious and hateful experiences and traumas. So when we actually unravel and untangle and hair split and talk about who we are and dig and, and find the archives and retrieve them and celebrate them and contest using them, it's good for us, you know, because we are creating the future of our continent in a new way. So I think decoloniality is interesting uh, but I think it's old. I think it's boring. I don't think it is 
saying anything new. I've said that already. And Busi, my sister, agrees with me. So I'm not going to go there. But I want to tell you something. And I'm saying this with all the sincerity of a radical person who aspires to inclusivity. You cannot be a feminist as a man. Let me tell you why. Feminism is women's politics of resistance. You cannot switch code and say, now I'm a, I'm a feminist, uh, you know, and now I'm a male. No. As I said from the very beginning, my fundamental premise is this. Feminism today is the culmination of women's resistances to male privilege, which I, in my thinking, embed in the moment of surplus production. That's my radical Marxist left tradition that explains it for me. It may not explain it for you. Other people prefer to start the analysis somewhere else. But in my historical understanding or our historical, rather than his historical, our historical because his historical is his journey actually. So the word is not just a coincidence, it actually speaks to the marking of human knowledge as created by man. For many years, I said her historical because I was countering. Now it's our historical. It's our story. Uh, you know, because we are on this journey together, even though the men have been abusing us for a very long time. So for me, that story begins at that moment. And that for me is the framework of my explanations. That for me provides the grid for my new ideas to emerge, uh, you know, from, for the arguments that I might support or defend or put forward. So if we agree, as I hope we will, that feminism is a politics of women's resistance to patriarchy, you as a male, you benefit from patriarchy in the same ways that whites benefit from, race, from racism, whether they like it or not, whether they've named themselves anti-racist, liberal or left, you know, et cetera. The fact of the matter is that in the infrastructures of power, when you enter as a white person, you have benefits, whether you exercise them or not. It's the same with men all societies, all societies. So I always say to my male comrades, my brothers, if you genuinely believe, uh, if you genuinely believe that we need to create, to craft new societies that are different fundamentally from these that we live in now, that mark us in particular ways, then you have to disembed yourself from patriarchal privilege and you have to redefine yourself as a man through a politics of resistance to patriarchy that's, that begins from you as a man, from your maleness. You see, you can't hit your wagon on our politics because we are fighting from a particular standpoint because we experience life in a particular way that is directly connected with our living in these female bodies, particularly black female bodies that are working class or that are outside of the system, outside of the state. So men, we need you, the time is overdue. You need to create the new discourses of emancipation of, by, of men, black men from patriarchy. We will help you, you know, we will share with you how we were able to initiate the journey of freedom from being yes women to patriarchy because for a very long time and still most of us, we are afraid to be free. We've learned the dictums of patriarchy that you can only be a woman in these ways and those ways must not challenge or shake or disrupt male privilege. And the man will be nice. He's a nice guy, you know. 
so I'll do the dishes with you. But really fundamentally, doing dishes is a woman's job. They describe themselves as helping in the house. Helping? Are you a visitor? You live here, you throw your socks in the box. I mean, really, how can you be helping? Huh? But it's not, you see, it's not a collective division of labor that is based on fundamental principles of fairness and equality. So the point I'm making is this, you men who are radical and who are left and who are progressive and all the things, the nice things you call yourselves, let's see now, let's see the rubber hit the road. You have to form the movements, you have to create the discourses and don't, don't appropriate feminist discourses craft the new discourses of about yourselves as men and consistently don't make it just a, an occasional event when you go to a feminist conference and you stand up and you declare yourself a feminist and you say i i changed the baby's napkins no because we are very serious and we've only gotten to this point as feminists as radical women because we are committed i have spent literally my whole life as a feminist I can remember being 14 years old and knowing that I will never allow anybody to violate my integrity. And I've fought ever since. And people say, why are you so angry? You're always angry. I said, but wouldn't you be angry if you had a chain around your neck? Wouldn't you be fighting to remove the chain around your neck? Huh? So that's my response to you, my dear brother. Sexism for me, is an ideological expression of patriarchal supremacy. It's an ideological expression of supremacy, which is a foundation stone of patriarchy. The superiority of men over women. And they express it through sexism. And the, in, in, in the intellectual circles, black men don't read our work because they think that, you know, it's like a waste of time. I yeah. know people whose conferences I have been to, whose papers I have read, who have never read a single piece by Pat McFadden, never. They cannot bring themselves to it. In the same way that in the white dominated academy, whites cannot accept that we as black people, we are intellectuals. They can't. It's so difficult for them, you know? Even when you publish with them, they put the name, the white woman's name first, and then they list the black people underneath. I mean, all kinds of expressions of this inability to accept you as a total person, a complete person with an intellect that, that complements the intellect of all other human beings. And that's the core, that's the basic uh, uh, touchstone of feminism and of the future. So we can have all the other conversations, you know, uh, but uh, me, I stay on this one road and I've done so since I was 14 years old and I'm not about to change. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Desmond. Was, uh, yeah, thank, thank you, you Desmond. For thank you for stimulating me and making me think about it. Thank you. I really appreciate this. And I want to get to the other issues. It hopefully wouldn't need to take as much time, but just a few uh, clarifications here. So, Number one, I think I perhaps should have clarified when I started uh, what I meant by matriarchy. Uh, and I don't think I'm defining matriarchy in the ways you are defining it. I was defining matriarchy uh, in the ways that my mother, who I was referring to specifically, was the dominant parent. Uh, 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 no. yeah, I, I'll, I'll come no. to you now. No. <laughs> Let, let, let me let me just oh. clarify what I, what I mean here, okay? So I'm just telling you, this is the way I was defining this. And it's, I understand that it's, this is different from the way you're thinking about this, but just so you know, this is how I was approaching it, okay? Um, I was thinking about my mother, who was the dominant parent in my life. And for very many reasons, that I don't think we have time to, uh, to go into. But also, um, in a society, in, a, in an environment where she was not unique in doing that. There were many other women like her, okay? The second clarification um, that I think might be helpful uh, here is that I do 
think um, it might be possible that um, it, it was not clear uh, earlier what I was uh, attempting to, uh, to, uh, to ask as a question. And I will get to that in, in one moment. I think also that there is the, there is a tendency, if I understand you correctly, to think that the, the struggle for freedom that I think you talk about um, uh, several times has to be accomplished uh, out of dissonance. I actually agree with a lot of what, you, what you've said already. That is, the, the instinct of freedom is innate in human. I've made that argument so many times. I can't imagine any situation in which any human being is held captive and they do not struggle to re re release themselves from that bondage. I also think that personally, it's absurd to think that a man for being a man cannot be committed in that struggle with women. So even if in your understanding, mm. it is possible for a man to be a feminist, uh, perhaps in the same way that uh, one would extrapolate that it's impossible for a white person to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think, uh, and this is a subject that I, I also engage with quite actively. I do think that to be committed to the struggle for freedom, to be committed to resistance does not require that you first of all, or does not require that you must in some ways, stop benefiting from the systems of oppression. And I'll tell you what I mean here. The, the systems of oppression are systemic the way that you've described already. I think this is something we all are familiar with. So it is difficult as a human being to walk through the earth, depending on how you are born, where you are born and so forth, and completely shed yourself of those privileges. You can, as I think you admit, work against that. That is, you can make conscious choices to rid yourself of those people. I'll give you an example, something that doesn't have to do with gender. I was at a conference once in an African context. And at the opening ceremony, so they had an opening ceremony, someone had the insight to invite me to a high table because I was coming from the, from the US. And I could sense immediately the way that the US was held up against others. Other bosses. And there were people attending this conference from other parts of the world, including other parts of Africa. And I remember saying, no, I'm not going to this table because I don't think every other country has been equally represented. Now, this perhaps is a very insignificant moment, but I think to me, looking for opportunities or identifying opportunities like that to resist the ways in which in your person, in spite of your own choices, are being thrust with these privileges. I think is enough for someone to be engaged in that struggle. You don't have to arrive at the point where 100% you are already, you've already read yourself or, or, or removed yourself from systems of privilege for you then to be qualified to engage in that struggle. That's an argument I'm willing to consider because if I were to do that, then I cannot in any way engage in this meaningful struggle for freedom that I've come to define myself and my careers and futures uh, with. I think um, the other thing then to return to the question I was asking is that essentially the point I was trying to raise here is, if I understand you correctly, you were dissociating decoloniality from feminism. And I think both of them are pursuing essentially the same agenda. I think it is possible for them to pursue the same agenda if we recognize that we're still talking about that, that notion of freedom. And we don't have to all speak about everything at the same time. We can attempt to speak about everything as in as many opportunities as we find, but I don't think that anyone even has to be a self-avowed feminist for them to engage in this quest of freedom. I don't think so. And that is this, the essential point I'm making, especially when we're talking about a, com a continent as vast and complex and diverse as Africa. Okay. But let me one. go to the other, yeah. other uh, no, comments. No, 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 and I think no, I'll just make them no, quick. No, no, no. I think we, we've really, really gone well beyond our time. So, um, Perhaps uh, the conversation can be continued 
um, offline. Uh, but for now, we really, really have gone beyond our time. So um, I think all that's left for me now is to thank on all of your behalf, um, Patricia for a breathtakingly beautiful and challenging uh, discussion. You've given us so much to think about. And I thought I might conclude by referring to Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, who says that we should all be feminists. But I just might be treading on a thin ice <laughs> in saying that. Um, I mean, Amama also wonders why uh, uh, male scholars are not coming to the feminist table. Um, but from today's lecture, I, I think I have a much more nuanced understanding of what this uh, others are saying. So um, very briefly, Kim, would you be so kind as to tell us uh, who our next speaker will be? Yeah, so on um, Friday, August 6th at 9 a.m. Eastern time, we'll have Bernard Spolsky from Bar Ilan University, and they'll be talking about continued thoughts on language policy. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Kim. Thanks, everybody, for being part of this. And Patricia, thanks a million. It was really Thank very you. inspiring. Thank you. So um, if you just uh, allow me to say to Desmond that the more he wriggles, the deeper he will sink. Yeah. <laughs> the more you resist, the more the farther behind you will be. And you see, conflating things is actually mm. a strategy of obfusc obfuscation. Yes. And you know, you have to find a way to hear the issue in its own sense. And then you can actually either decide that you're going to embrace it or you're not going to embrace it. But if you are reactive to new ideas, you cannot actually take the next step on your journey, okay? So just think about that because Desmond, in many ways, you respect <laughs> many of the resistances that we as feminists have encountered for the past 40, 50 years on this continent. And we cannot make the shift <laughs> if, we, if we are not able to get past our resistances. And that's what privilege does to human yes. beings. Mm -hmm. It makes it so difficult to actually embrace new ideas when you've become comfortable in the skin that privilege has created for you. But thank you so much, my sister Busi. Thank you all of you for your time uh, and uh, for the pleasure of having this beautiful engagement with you. Thank you, Makoni, uh, Sintri. Thank you so much for having made this happen. And to Johi also, who, with yeah. whom I have conversed and uh, planned and, you know, and thank you, thank you, thank you many times. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Um, I will, have, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye, Basi. Bye. 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 Uh, this was um, one of the most. This was one of the most. Different. Can we? Um, yeah, I'll send.